Hey, Recovery Guy here. I'm gonna do a video for you guys today about step two. Um, what, what can we say about step two? It's a bit of a weird one. Um, it is simultaneously the thing that drives the most amount of people out of the rooms, but it's also the same thing that actually, it's the only thing that makes this whole program work. In a, in a 12 step fellowship, it's a faith-based recovery program, if you wanna call it that, and the only reason that we're able to recover as far as this philosophy goes is because we believe in a power greater than yourself. So it's very divisive, it's very divisive, divisive, divisive. Yeah, it's divisive. People don't like it. People don't want to like uh, sacrifice their thinking and their actions over to the care of something that they may or may not believe in. So today we're just going to talk a little bit about step two, how it doesn't need to be as weird as most people think and how, you know, just in kind of the general parameters as to, as to why or how it even works. Um, if we want to simplify step two down to like one line, it's just a willingness to believe. And I think this is where a lot of people kind of part ways with it is because like, I'm, we can't just expect you guys to believe in a power greater than yourself right off the bat. Like just because we say so, just because we say your sobriety depends upon your belief in this power doesn't mean that you're just automatically going to be like, Oh, okay. A bunch of random drug addicts and alcoholics said, so I'm going to do it. It doesn't normally work like that. But all that we do ask of you is just to express or have a humble willingness to believe that there might be something that could basically save you from the depths of alcoholism. Here's the thing. Our thoughts, our behaviors are the very things that are destroying us here. And it's in, in, extremely hard to um, call into consciousness the exact times and places and the exact thoughts in which we started to go wrong. You know, like we, we can rely on our brain for a lot of things. Like I can, we can all tie our shoes. We could have jobs. We could hold down relationships. That point in which I'm no longer being sane and I'm switching over to insane thinking is very subtle. And to us, the afflicted, it's indistinguishable from just regular thought. So it's hard for us to just give up our primary mode of operating in the world in favor of some grand idea of some like higher power that's going to like rescue us from the depths of alcoholism. It's, it's far fetched and it's not normal. You know, in cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, you get your piece of paper, they have some skills on it that you practice the skills. It's a, it's a very practical, like hands on tangible thing. And, and it, it, as far as a 12 step recovery, goes it's like prayer and meditation which are not so tangible i mean it turns out they, they they will give you tangible results but you can't like you know grab that i don't know it's just difficult you guys know i hope you guys know what i'm talking about here so we have also the we have obviously the people who are unwilling to believe that there's such a thing as a higher power that can you know help them from alcoholism and then we have the group of people that are they they it's very hard to distinguish your thoughts from God's will, as we like to say in 12-step fellowships. Just the same as it's hard to differentiate between your own thoughts, sane and insane, it's hard to differentiate between like what you, you know, what you, the thoughts that you have, whether they're based on your conditioning or whether they're based on the wishes of Jeebus. Um, it's incredibly subtle and it's incredibly hard to figure out. That's why in 12 step fellowships, we're like, get a sponsor, get a home group, get a support group, get, talk to as much people as you can in order to try and narrow down, you know, the right thing to do, I guess, in each situation. And I'll give you guys, like, it's incredibly hard to figure out what to do. It's very complex to be alive these days with all the rules and the, and the interpersonal relationships. And you know, you're an, you're an employee, you're an employer, you're a tax paying citizen, you're a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's very hard to figure out all the rules. Okay. So let's get into what your higher power can't be. Now I don't want to be like super presumptuous. Like, I don't want to be the guy who tells you what, like, you know, I'm not the authority on, you know, your higher power is incorrect and your higher power is incorrect. But I mean, let's not be ridiculous. There's a lot of people that I heard today, one of the guys in my group said Air Jordans can be your higher power. Those are shoes. Your shoes cannot be your higher power. Although we do know that each Air Jordan is imbued with the spirit of Michael himself. They're not actually going to help you get sober. It can't be a light bulb. It can't be a doorknob. It can't be anything like that. It's got to be a power greater than human power. I could kill every single doorknob in my house and in Vancouver. I could kill 
every light. I can turn on, like I control these things. They do not control me. So obviously, and, and even you could say in a weird way, like the light bulb makes me have to turn it on and off because I can't see and the light bulb is actually controlling me. And that's a completely valid perspective. I just don't really care about all that kind of stuff. A light bulb is not going to transcend my way of thinking and bring me into this like new way of life. Okay. So it can't be anything. Now, obviously the examples of like Air Jordans, light bulbs, don't, like whatever, those examples are all really, really stupid, okay? There's ones that aren't so stupid, but are still, in my opinion, take it or leave it, off, off the table. So a really common one is a group of drunks. There's an acronym for God, group of drunks. So that's a, that's a very, very common conception of a higher power. And you know what? When you're in really, really early recovery and you have no idea about the 12 steps and you're really not sure if you want to like get on board with this whole higher power concept, I mean, that's a, that's a valid, it's a tool. It's a tool to, to, to get you in the door because it's easier to wrap your head around taking advice from people in recovery that, you know, you come to know and maybe even respect and then to just pray and just like sit there and wait for answers. The only reason I would say the group of drunks is, is it's not an actual power. It's not a power than greater than human power. It's just a bunch of people sitting around think tank style trying to figure out what the best way to live is. And there's nothing wrong with that except for, you know, we don't, you know, this group can serve as a proxy for a higher power. They can try and, and, and figure out maybe as, as to the best of their ability, what they think their higher power wants of them. But the only reason that that's a bad thing is because you can't just carry this think tank around with you. Um, I know today with cell phones and texting and, you know, Facebook messenger and stuff like that, it's really easy to like, you know, I, I could any, any time I want, I could go on my phone and contact a thousand people in recovery that are perfectly more than willing to give me advice. The problem with that is they're not with me and, and it, it's still my choice whether to contact them or not. Maybe I won't contact them. Maybe, uh, maybe these people don't have my best interests at heart. Maybe they're stupid. Maybe they are part of the 99% of people who just chronically relapse out there. And I don't know, like maybe I'm new in recovery and I don't know like the difference between good advice and bad advice. If you guys aren't armed with the facts about the illness of alcoholism and addiction, and like anything that people tell you is gonna make sense. Things that make you feel good, things that on their face, face sound good and it's reasonable to be like, hey, you know, that's actually a great idea. But we, but you don't know that. That's the problem. You don't know if these things are good ideas. So a group of drunks, although it's a helpful tool, always have a support network. It can act as a proxy for a higher power. A group of drunks is not a higher power. It is human power. It's just a bunch of people sitting there thinking. Here's another one that a lot of people use. And um, I don't know. I think this is kind of maybe born out of our societies, like over identification with the intellect and over identification with smarts. And people say like, you know, just be logical and just be reasonable. They say, well, okay, well, I'll just, you know, I'll think my way out of this thing. You know, when I feel like doing this, I will just play the tape. When I think about doing this, I just won't do that if I feel that what I'm doing is wrong. Or, or maybe before I decide whether to like jump into this relationship, I got to really think to myself, am I really hurting people by doing this? Is it going to actually hurt people? Am I being unselfish? Am I being loving? Is this something that's going to be good for the both of us? And yada, yada, blah, blah. And I mean, uh, by all means, ask your guys, ask yourselves that question. But logic and reason cannot be your higher power because you are not logical and you are not reasonable. You are an emotional creature and the alcoholic and addict more than most people is largely driven by their emotions. Even the more logical ones of us still end up chronic re chronically relapsing. Because we gotta understand something, like what is the function of logic? What is the function of logic and reasoning things out? Well, if you go back to rationalism, you know, it's kind of like the counter to empiricism where you need to touch and feel and see and observe in order to reach a scientific conclusion. The rationalists believe that you can reach conclusions about the world that are true immutable laws just by principles of reasoning. The problem with that is that there's an infinite number of facts and there is an infinite number of interpretations of these facts. People based on their own biological inclinations and psychological inclinations will perceive facts in a different way. If you guys go to a psychology 
uh, if you guys want to go get your bachelor's in psychology, you will have to take a course. Well, I don't know. I think you might be able to avoid it, but you're going to have to take a course and it's about interpreting stats because two stats can mean two different things to each people. You know, me and you know, my buddy Thomas, we can look at the exact same happening and we can draw completely different conclusions. That guy was definitely right. No way. What are you talking about? That guy was wrong. That's why it's wrong to use logic and reason because logic and reason needs to be nested in a greater narrative structure and then direct it at a certain to achieve a certain ideal. I mean, there's a, there's also that phenomenon of post hoc construction and that post hoc construction is when when you immediately before you're even aware of what's going on make a decision based on your emotional nature and then what happens is your logic and reason actually come in afterwards to rationalize and justify the decision you already made before you were even aware that you've made it. So if you guys want to learn more about this post hoc construction, there's a TED talk about it. It's a really, really good TED talk. So there's lots of situations where logic will let you down. And I know that I used, I employed the powers of logic and reason for bad when I was, a, when I was in active addiction. Um, I used to steal from stores because I would rather spend my money on drugs and I get hungry. Even, even when I want candy or something like, I'm obviously not proud of this. It, I find it extremely juvenile and immature, but you know, when you're a heroin junkie, you do weird shit like that. Um, so I would always say like, I'm not gonna steal from a mom and pop shop. I'm only gonna steal from a, uh, a big box store and you know, all that's 7-Eleven. And uh, when I steal from 7-Eleven, the employees still make their same hourly wage and the managers still make their salary and no one actually loses money. The store loses money, which is a non-human entity and you know they factor theft into the budget. So I'm helping them stay on budget. I'm just joking, I didn't go that far with it, but I'm like, whatever, they budget this in anyways. And unless there's you know a million people like me, which is you know somewhat likely, then the store is not even gonna be losing money in compared to what the budget's for. And then, but even if the store does lose money, that just goes to head off and like where that missing money, that missing three dollars here and there is going all the way up into up up the chain until the people that are actually losing the money don't really know. Like they, they're not gonna worry. And so this is how I thought of it. And kind of logically I laid out this case. And the first time I went to treatment, I actually had counselors trying to convince me that stealing was wrong. And I would say these things to them and they were kind of like, well, I mean, yeah, like you have a point, but you're still wrong. Like the things that you're saying, I guess are true, but stealing is clearly wrong. And I was just like, nope, because I had laid out this logic trap. And I know like maybe some of you guys are thinking, well, that's stupid. I can counter that logic trap easily. All I'm trying to say is there is such a thing called a logic trap and people can get caught in it regardless of right or wrong, you can rationalize and you can justify and you can make anything reasonable. You know, lots of people were like about, they're about the yin, the yin and the yang. They're about the two opposing forces. Lots of people are about balance. They think there's some kind of cosmic balance. And you'd be surprised at how many people think that. And one of the people who actually thought this was Charles Manson. And this is what Charles Manson said in an interview that I watched. He said, you know what? You guys should be thanking me for what I did. And the reporters were like absolutely shocked. They're like, well, you know, what did you do? Like, how dare you basically? And he's like, you know what? There's good in this world and there's evil in this world, okay? Someone's gotta be good, someone's gotta be evil. I'm evil, you're good. There has to be evil and I'm the one that has to carry this burden. You guys should be thanking me because I took on all this evil so that you guys can be good. And. Like I know you, obviously Charles Manson is like a complete POS and he's a horrible, evil human, but like there's something about that that makes sense. I'm not saying like I fully agree with him. I'm not saying that he had to do all those things because there's a certain amount of like evil points floating out there that needs to be distributed amongst the population. But I don't know, it could be. And when he said that, people took a step back and he really caused them to think and I mean, he was a really manipulative son of a bitch and saying things like that was probably why he was able to convince people to do those horrible things. All I'm saying guys, logic and reason break down. They break down, especially with humans. In humans especially, logic and reason break down because logic and reason are like linear causal events that are more deterministic in nature. One plus one equals two. 
equals three, equals four, equals five. Humans aren't like that. We are unpredictable. All we can do is narrow down the potentials and the possibilities of how we're gonna act, how we're gonna react, how we're gonna behave, the thoughts that come into our mind, to like probabilities, but we never are determined in what we're gonna do. So when we're trying to use logic and reason, we just don't have the computing power or the amount of information in order to correctly employ our logic and reason to overcome alcoholism. And I want to get specific about the context in which I'm saying this. I'm talking about overcoming alcoholism. You guys can use your logic, logic and reason to do a bunch of other stuff. Um, all the power to you. I, I, you know, employ them where you feel necessary. But if you're mentally ill, which, you know, you are, and like, I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm also extremely mentally ill and I'm trying to get over it right now. But if you guys are, 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 are plagued by resentment and insecurity and your emotional nature is reacting to external stimuli, your logic and reason is going to be used against people and against yourself. And it's only going to further your destruction. So the more logical, the more reasonable you are, it's, you know, it's almost like a DBT thing. There's a wise mind in the middle, sorry, wise mind in the middle. There's a logic mind, emotion mind. If you're too emotional, you're screwed. If you're too logical, you're screwed. So if you make logic and reason your higher power, that is the top, the absolute top. That is the pinnacle of your hierarchy of values. The number one thing that you covet and worship in this world is logic and reason using your, I guess, fallible brain and, and you're given all of our inadequacies and the fact that we don't have all the information and we don't know everything about everything, you placing logic and reason at the top of this like hierarchy and using that as our higher power is going to fail. But I'm going to shut up about all this stuff right now and uh, let's, you know, Here's the thing, when you guys wanna pick a higher power for yourself, let's get down to, I guess, here's like the most important criteria for your higher power. It's like, it's gotta be independent from your thinking. It's gotta be under the assumption that like what I know now is not good enough to overcome alcoholism. If you guys are a chronic relapser or you've been to treatment a bunch of times, which would obviously mean you're a chronic relapser, or like you just are just starting your kick at the can and you're not sure and you're just like drinking here and there, like trying to decide if you wanna stay sober or not, most important criteria for a higher power is it must, it must be independent from your thinking. Guys, we don't make the rules. Me, Joey, I don't make the rules that govern people's success or people's uh, journey from, from being a, a, an active addiction to like being supremely you know, confident in their life and having tons of well-being and all that kind of stuff. I don't make those rules. Those rules are out there for me to discover. I don't know where they are. I don't know where these rules exist. I know people have tried to conceptualize these rules over, or over eons. Every philosophical system, every religious belief system, even secular belief systems, we're all going for something that's approximating heaven. And different behaviors get us there and certain behaviors cause us to get away from there. Certain things give us well-being and certain things take it away. I don't get to decide that. I don't make that up. What I can do is make it my life's journey to find out what these rules are, act them out, let them consume me, embody these rules as best I can, and also help others along the way. That's all I can do. So this higher power, it can't be in here. It's got to be bigger and better than my own thinking mind because my thinking mind is trying to kill me but will settle for me drunk or high. Now, about the actual idea of God itself, and, and I know that I saved this subject to the end because it's, it, I mean, it's the hardest one. I, I don't even feel like we need to spend a lot of time going over this, but people don't believe in God. Guys, I'm not going to say it's good or bad that you do, but I honestly just don't care. You guys don't have to believe in any particular conception of God. I don't know how many times we have to go over this in a 12 step fellowship program, but you do not have to believe in any specific, you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ. You don't have to believe in God, God. You don't have to believe in Allah. You don't have to believe in whatever the hell Odin. You guys can make up your own conception. For me, 
it's not even really that mystical. Here's other ways of, of viewing God. So you can, you can view it as I said before, as a set of rules. There's a certain set of rules and in this game of life that governs your journey from, from down here to up here. I don't decide these rules, neither do you. If you go around acting like you make the rules, you're going to fail. And it is in my belief that this is what we have been doing. We've always wanted to try and do the thing that would make our life go better. And we always fail. We can't do it. It's, it doesn't exist in here. What I know now is not good enough. I need to read books. I need to pray. I need to meditate. I need to go out there. I need to try things. I need to confer with my fellows. It's up to me to discover what these rules are. God can legitimately just be a set of rules. You can define God as the laws of nature. You know, it, it, when we're talking about like, let, let's let's uh, put aside the, the question of psychological health and, and mental well-being and stuff like that. Let's just take physically like, um, do I get healthier when I eat a bunch of candy and disregard fruits and vegetables? No, of course I don't. I wish I did. There was a long period of time that I thought I did. Didn't go very well. Um, another question, do I get more physically fit and more jacked and more tanned by sitting on the couch doing absolutely nothing all day every day? Glad you said that, that's correct, the answer is no. So here's what you gotta ask yourself, who came up with that? Those rules. Why doesn't candy make us healthy and sitting on the couch make us healthy? Who decided that? And hey, that might even be a dumb question because it's like, well, what do you mean who? You could say mother nature or the laws of nature or evolution, evolution and nature and whatever the physics, <laughs> whatever the physics has set up this structure that we now live in. Nature, just the laws of nature set this up. And if we don't abide by the laws of nature, then we're going to be screwed. And in lots of uh, ancient Greek philosophies, you know, back to the whole reason thing, there was, there was two things that you needed to live a successful life. It was to live with right reason in accordance with natural law. Right reason in accordance with natural law. and. What, is, what do you mean right reason in accordance with natural law? Well, let's just see what right reason would do without being in accordance to natural law. I think that as addicts and alcoholics, most of us subconsciously, without knowing it, worship ease and comfort, okay? Our emotional nature is our higher power. We are subservient to our emotions. We will do anything to get out of bad emotions and we will do goddamn anything to experience good emotions. And you guys know that, even if it means killing ourselves. So if our version of right reason is like, hey, you know, it'd be reasonable to be maximum happy 100% of the time. Wow, I'm just going to do things that make me happy 100% of the time and then that'll just maximize my ability at being happy and I'll always be happy. Now, obviously, it doesn't take a rocket appliance to figure that out. It's like nature doesn't support 100% positive emotion all the time, nor would I think you guys would even enjoy your life if that was the case. We need adversity. We need the lows to experience the highs. We need challenges to overcome or we degenerate into nothing. You know, there's a famous thought experiment where it's like, you know, give a man everything he wants, all the money, the setting, the house, everything he could possibly imagine he could spring into being and, you know, leave him there for a year. And the first thing he'll do after like the second month there is he'll just do anything just to tear the structure down because human beings adapt to resistance. Physically, we adapt to resistance and mentally and spiritually, we adapt to resistance. We need to meet a challenge and overcome and it is in the overcoming and the facing of these challenges that we discover meaning and purpose in our lives. And meaning and purpose is going to trump our emotional nature every time. I don't care that much about how I'm feeling at any given time because I've got my YouTube channel, I've got my sponsees, I've got my career, I've got a relationship with a beautiful woman and I have all these things in my life that I'm currently bashing myself against and try and improve. So you know what? I'm doing things that I never thought I was able to do and in pursuit of that, I don't, I don't care about the I don't know how to describe it to you guys. I mean, I'm, I, 
because I'm pursuing these things, the, de the end goal is more important to me. So any kind of emotional hit or trigger or high and low I'll experience on the way is just a temporary thing on the way to a meaningful goal. Now, you guys might be able to describe God as a functional belief system. It, it is in my belief that a large part of what we do in 12-step fellowships is switch out our belief system for a new belief system, okay? Ideas, attitudes, emotions that were once the guiding forces of our lives are suddenly cast to one side and a completely new set of conceptions and motivations begin to dominate us. So that's a boom complete personality change. The way that I view the world is different now. For me, it's not about my emotional nature. It's not about um, just ease and comfort. It's not about being happy all the time. For me, it's about accepting voluntary, voluntary responsibility for the welfare of myself and the people around me. And, and it's about acting in a spiritual manner. It's about emotional stability. It's about, you know, tending to my responsibilities instead of spending all my, my energy trying to avoid responsibilities and live in never never land with the lost boys again it's about being a man it's about stepping up to the plate and it's about accepting the suffering that's intrinsic with our lives with a smile on my face and trying to help others along the way and doing that kind of stuff is deeply meaningful for me i pray every day for the strength to do this i pray every single day for the the, the vision to see how to actualize this vision for my future and the power to actually carry it out. All right, guys, that was step two. I hope you heard something today that, that you guys liked. If you have any further questions, please just uh, put them in the comment section and I actually write them down in my book here. And uh, at, when I get enough questions, I will actually do like a, a Q and A period for you guys. So um, thanks for stopping by again and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. I will see you next week.